afternoon over there. My name is Austin Ikechukubasozo. I am here to introduce, I'm the session, coach session chair, and I am introducing uh, Professor Alexander M. Kusinki. He is going to be the speaker of the day, today's uh, gathering. Professor Speaker is a fellow from the, and the dean in the Trinity College. He is in the Department of uh, Engineering Science. He is experienced professor. He had his uh, BSc, he has an MC and uh, he has his uh, PhD, all in uh, Engineering Sciences. He has published a lot of articles and uh, he has done a lot of research as well. He will be talking to us today. So join me to welcome Professor in today's uh, sitting. Thank you so much. And, uh, uh, reminded, yeah, for this uh, nature series, the same as our other distinguished scientists, laureate, all of them will be record and we will produce, I mean, the old free open access uh, video to be included in our Distinguished Scientist video series. And this will be part of the series. It is our great honor. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sunny. Yeah. Thank you, colleagues. Um, so uh, thanks to the session chair, Austin, for the introduction. My name is Alexander. Um, I uh, uh, founded and uh, uh, uh supervised uh, the multi-beam laboratory for engineering microscopy uh which is part of the rolls-royce university technology center in solid mechanics in oxford and i also uh, uh created a center for in situ processing studies at diamond light source which is uk synchrotron uh, i'll talk a little bit about all this work but uh, as motivation uh, I would say that my interest in uh, structural design, that is uh, um, achieving and ensuring uh, structural integrity, strength, uh, reliability of aerospace engineering components, um, uh, started in, through collaboration with Rolls-Royce uh, uh, civil aero engines. So this is to design the uh, high temperature work of uh, a combustion chamber of the turbine, also the compressor that is at the start of the engine. I have in the past talked about the design of the IRA engine and uh, what challenges exist there. But today uh, I would like to broaden the topic a little bit and talk about the hierarchical statistical analysis of strain and residual stress effects. And I hope this somewhat complicated title will become uh, clear as we go along. I will also uh, uh, start my uh, talk by saying that my interests in materials um, uh, structure and properties is somewhat wider than just materials for IRA engines. I uh, have been for almost a decade editor-in-chief of Materials and Design, uh, which is uh, an international, uh, leading international journal in this field. And it looks at all sorts of materials, not just structural, but also uh, electronic, magnetic, uh, uh, functional uh, biomaterials, materials for therapeutic treatment, for drug delivery, etc. So a very wide uh, range of topics it covers. Uh, but my own work uh, has recently been uh, gathered together in a monograph, which is called a teaching essay on residual stresses and eigenstrains. I will explain a little bit what this term eigenstrain means, but in the picture on the right, you see the cover of the book and uh, the grayscale picture that you see there is the SEM, the electron microscope picture of the surface of nickel base 
superalloy, which is a particular class of materials used to make high temperature parts of the engine. And the colored inserts represent an idea of finite element modeling, which is a, an appropriate scale and down to the um, uh, atomic scale molecular dynamics model of the deformation and clearly deformation and the attendant stress is what determines the bearing capacity and the ability to use these um, uh, materials. Um, so I will uh, uh, flash uh, an abstract at you. There are some keywords there. Size effect, scaling of strength, coarse graining, hook, uh the uh, robert hook who uh we know as the uh, uh researcher who discovered or first postulated hook's law of elasticity but also was a great microscopist and so because this is a broad lecture for um uh, uh, broad audience i will talk about that a little bit and i will talk about the concept of mechanical microscopy but then the other part of my presentation concerns the statistics of stress and strain. And so I will cover that uh, aspect uh, as well. Um, and uh, I will start my uh, presentation. Uh, and uh, uh, the um, uh, story of size effect by uh, recalling the classical definitions of stress and strain. You have strain on the left, that's the descriptor of deformation, which deals with uh, percentage elongation, relative elongation of uh, volume of material uh, that, uh, uh, let me see, how do I uh, uh, select a, a laser pointer? I uh, don't know how, and this doesn't want to go in the right way. Um, um, okay. Um, this this uh, starts with a square section here. Uh, or, or rectangle, it could be, this is an element of material that we're looking at, and then it, on the one hand, undergoes this displacement here, but on the other hand, it may change shape, and it may elongate, and this is what we describe as strain in terms of these partial derivatives. What is key that I would like to draw your attention to here is that we are free to select the size of this region that we're considering. It could be kilometers long if we're looking at the movement of um, islands or large areas of Earth's surface or ice uh, floating uh, in the polar regions. Um, the definition doesn't change from that, or it could be uh, several atoms in size, so very small. So all this many orders of magnitude of size we can navigate, but accordingly, we will see things at the appropriate scale. Similarly, on the right, you have the definition of stress. Stress. And uh, uh, stress is... Uh, 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 Sorry, uh, stress is uh, here. So uh, uh, the concept of stress uh, comes from a similar um, uh, uh, definition where we select an area, we looked at, at the traction transmitted by that area, we define the uh, projections of that traction onto the axis, and that gives us stress. These are stress components. So fundamentally, uh, the definitions refer to a certain scale, and therefore, depending on the choice of scale, we can observe size effect, which means that there is scale dependence. And therefore, if we increase the resolution, look at smaller areas, we engage in what could be called mechanical microscopy. Now, I uh, uh, promised that I will talk about um, uh, 
uh, stre stresses and strains. So the total strain can be separated into elastic strain and eigenstrain. Um, so eigenstrain is a collective term for all uh, inelastic forms of strain. It could be plastic deformation, it could be um, uh, transformation strain, etc. Um, and therefore it represents memory of the material about the prior deformation history. But it's only the elastic part of strain that we need in order to um, uh, uh, calculate the stress. Okay, so uh, um, point eruptions, laser pointer, that's what I wanted. So here, this part is the elastic strain. We take it and we plug it into Hooke's law, multiply it by the stiffness matrix, we get the stress. Okay, so this is a very simple uh, formulation. First of all, strain is additive, depending on, on scale and is additive. The elastic part is what determines stress. The inelastic part is what determines inelastic deformation memory. Now, uh, depending on the uh, scale, uh, now I don't know how to remove this annotation, uh, 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 so we'll have to live with this. Uh, if you imagine you have a, a structure of, of material consisting of grains like this, and then we uh, look at the variation of, say, stress, residual stress along this axis, we will see that if we average across all the grains, we get type 1 line here. This is the average engineering stress. But if we average only within this grain, we'll get this value. Within this grain, we'll get this value. Within this grain, we'll get this value. This grain, we get this value. So there is deviation from average depending on the local grain. So this difference is called RS2. That's the difference between the prevailing macroscopic stress of type 1 and the local stress within the grain. Then if we zoom in even further and look at subgrain, very fine scale, we get this curve which jumps up and down and it represents local, really highly resolved stress value and the deviation of local value from the sum of 1 and 2, the next term, very local is type 3. Now, why is this important? Because as I have just introduced, if we're dealing with scale dependence, as we zoom in, we perceive more and more variation. Look, type 1, very coarse, low zoom, we get a straight line, a fixed value. If we zoom into grain level, we get some more variation. If we zoom in even further, we get even finer variation. So what does it tell us? It tells us that it's only in classical, traditional 19th and 20th century engineering that we can say that stress is uh, a slowly varying uh, value, number. In fact, with modern tools, when we zoom in, we will see a lot of variation. So naturally, we will ask ourselves, what is the statistics of this variation? What general statistical uh, rules can be formulated to describe it. And that's what I wanted to talk about. This is another we, illustration. We, yeah. We, we can try to close the presentation file and then open it again. And uh, I, I can try that if if, if people yeah. don't mind. I don't, uh, we don't mind because we, we still have a, quite a lot of uh, slides. And also this is for video recording. Maybe close okay, the, so the whole program. Let, yeah. let me close it. Yeah. Ooh. yeah. Uh huh. Okay, I think now it's finally disappeared. Yeah. Uh, let me open it again. Yeah. Let me share the screen. Let me select the right slide. Yes. And let me share it like this. Hmm. Uh, and then I need to find a pointer. And then if I go down, yeah, I get to the point yeah. that I want. 
Good. Oh, yes. Thank you, <laughs> colleagues. Thank you, Sunny, for your help. Welcome. Okay. So, look at this hierarchy of scales, as I call it. So when engineers design, or rather, I would say designed in the past, um, bits of machinery, cars, uh, chemical plant, bridges, uh, gear, uh, etc., they assume that the material is continuum. And they describe it with this mesh, like here, finite element mesh, and they assume that the material properties very smoothly and so on. In reality today, we can zoom in and look under the microscope and I'll show some examples and we will see that what we think of as just metal, steel, whatever, in fact consists of grains which are glued together. And that's the next level down. If we zoom in further, we will see that inside grains, we see these dislocations they're colored in different ways here, but effectively it's like a network of stringy lines inside the metal, which determine its plastic deformation and hardening and so on. If we zoom in even further, we will see individual atoms. Now, much of this is imaginary or was imaginary until recently, but now actually it is possible with tools uh, such as microscopes to see such individual atoms here in white, uh, you have the atoms inside the grains. In cyan color, uh, light blue, you have grain boundaries. And in red, you have twins, which is a particular type of uh, crystal lattice uh, distortion. So all that, or rather that paradigm, that philosophical approach to study in nature, we inherited from this man, the man was a, a remarkable engineer, scientist, and artist, I would say, and I will explain to you why, but he was a scientist artist rather than a painter, because painters love painting what they see and also painting auto-portraits, pictures of themselves. Now, Hook wasn't like that. He was a... Uh, scientist who was interested in the nature in front of him so we do not have a single portrait of him this portrait is drawn much much later like an imaginary picture of what he might be like but what he was working on he started to work with Boyle of Boyle Marriott law of a gas um, behavior ideal gas behavior but then he got interested in microscopy and mechanics and he introduced the term cell in biology. I'll show how he did it. The spirit level, the diaphragm in the camera, the watch pendulum, the constant velocity joint. He was really prolific and he was appointed curator of experiments for the Royal Society. And he introduced into the papers that people submitted to the Royal Society the description of of materials and methods that we use to this day. So very important uh, development. Now, uh, on the bottom right is the famous constant velocity joint. You see that even though the two axes are not perfectly aligned, uh, the jo joint that is built here allows the rotation to happen continuously by uh, means of this cross in green here. Uh, accommodating different orientation and that's a great achievement and it's still used in all the cars where as you can imagine as the car drives along the position of the wheels with respect to the um, uh, main uh, shaft can change and this is accommodated by this uh, constant velocity joint of this type but he also introduced the uh, famous Hooke's law which essentially says establish the proportionality for elastic behavior between load and displacement. He wrote it in Latin as ut tensio sic vis, which means as the extension, so is the force. So that is the statement of proportionality. The more you extend, the greater force you need. And in the style of the time, he rearranged the letters into an anagram. Here they're in alphabetic order and published it and the idea of that was to claim 
uh, priority because if somebody came up with the same statement later, he'd say, oh no, in 1685, I've already published it as this anagram and here is the uh, sole uh, solution of this anagram and therefore I was the first. But the most interesting for us perhaps is his book called Micrographia or some physiological descriptions of minute bodies made by magnifying glasses with observations and inquiries thereupon. Um, and here is a picture of that book that I took in the library of Trinity College where the first edition is kept. And you can see on the left, the picture that Hooke drew of an ant. Now imagine at the time there was no photography, no digital camera. He could look down the ocular of the microscope. He could see what he was looking at at good resolution, but he couldn't capture it uh, uh, with uh, 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 a photograph. Uh, so he had to draw. And you can see that he really took a lot of care to draw this. Here are some more examples. This is the tip of the needle, which of course at the time people thought was very, very sharp. And Hook shows that once you zoom in, you see pits, you see that it's rounded. If you look at wood, you see a grain of wood. If you look at leaves, you see this cellular structure. And so he called individual uh, sections of this structure cells and from him, we have the use of the word cell in biology. He also looked at tiny crystals and noticed that they had these facets and started to think about the relationship between the facets and the way little spheres could be packed in the inside the material. Now, this is way, way before uh, the discovery of atoms and crystal structure and so on. Of course, the famous Greek, Greek philosophers have come up with the idea of atoms, but uh, it was a long time before uh, this all became known. So he was uh, way ahead of time. And here is an example of the description, all in English, unlike Newton, who wrote in Latin, which wasn't understandable to most people, at least in that country. Uh, but uh, Hook wrote in English, and he described what he did he described what he saw and he took uh, a careful drawings, painstaking drawings. And here is a drawing of an eye of a fly. And you can see that it consists of these tiny photosensitive regions. Professor yeah. Korsky, yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, uh, I think there was a glitch in the connection. But yes, uh, yes. So, so uh, at the time when Hook was uh, writing his Micrographia book, uh, there was a plague. The plague was a terrible uh, situation in Europe, when almost half of the population, maybe a third of the population, I can't remember, but many millions uh, died, and people didn't know at the time. Uh, the causes of the plague. So Hook uh, offered to help and he used his microscope to look at the flea. The flea is a little tiny creature which is only two millimeters or so long. And uh, having studied uh, the uh, animal, uh, Hook uh, suggested that it may carry the uh, contagion, the, the source of the disease, somewhere in his, in its uh, belly or on its legs. And it's only a hundred years or more than a hundred years later that a uh, French scientist, Alexander Yersin, uh, discovered so-called Yersinia pestis, which is the bacterium that carries the plague. 
And here you see its picture under the electron microscope and the scale bar here is about two microns. So you have to go a thousand times uh, better resolution to see these little creatures. And of course, then you need to go another thousand times better to see the DNA, which is the recording of the uh, life uh, secret of bacteria and other uh, creatures. Uh, and that was achieved uh, later again in 1952 by uh, Watson Crick and uh, Rosalind Franklin and, and others. So what determines the resolution? The resolution is determined by the diffraction limit. Now, it was airy uh, in the mid-19th century, then Rayleigh, late, the end of 19th century, then Fraunhofer, Fresnel, Helmholtz, and Abbey ultimately uh, formulated the di diffraction limit. It says that the limit of your resolution is related to the wavelength of light that you use because when the light passes through a pinhole, it blurs, it grows into a, uh, a picture of an airy disk. And if you want to resolve two point sources, you need to have them apart at least about uh, half of the wavelength of light. Now, that meant that you couldn't uh, resolve everything as you wanted by um, uh, uh, optical means. And so in the 1920s and 30s, people developed electron microscope. The joke here is that electrons uh, have much shorter wavelength, and therefore the resolution can be much better. And so Ernst Ruska was the guy who first designed the electron microscope in 1931, and then he uh, got a Nobel Prize more than 50 years later. Uh, he was a real survivor. Uh, but the real breakthrough was that the job of the all these lenses and electron microscope was to focus the electron beam to the smallest possible point. And then some detectors would register the uh, secondary electrons. And if you raster, if you scan over the surface and register the brightness of your signal at every point, then you will get uh, a synthetic picture. You should realize that if you do rastering and recording and then build a synthetic picture, it's already unreal picture. It's a synthetic uh, digital uh, picture that you build because as you scan, you go through pixels. And that's, uh, I would like you to know that here it says TV scanner because it's like a television in inverted. You, you use the beam to uh, raster the surface of the sample, you collect the signal. But that wasn't enough. In order to do the highest resolution still, people uh, came up with diffraction methods and that started with uh, Lauer discovering that X-rays can diffract from the crystal lattice and that led to the formulation of Bragg's law, which gives us the relationship between D, sine theta and lambda. And you can see that if your lambda is very, very short, even if you can't focus it very well, which is difficult with high energy X-rays and electrons, but diffraction allows you to determine with high precision the spacing between atoms uh, based on the angle measurement, which we can do very well. And so that was uh, a great breakthrough, which is actually how we discovered the structure of uh, uh, crystalline materials. So in modern situation, the way it is set up, you have an X-ray beam traveling at the sample. Here is the sample gripped. And then the, the, the beam is scattered. And from the angle of scattering, we can get a diffraction pattern like this. Now that diffraction pattern is very informative. It has lots of peaks. The peaks centers tell us about deformation and strain. The intensity of peaks tells us about texture. Uh, and phase, uh, uh, here we have to see the phase composition, and then we can also uh, do whole pattern refinement and so on. Now, what that allowed uh, us to do uh, some years ago, maybe a decade, maybe two decades ago, is to take a piece of metal and take it through a cyclic loading stress strain, 
and look at different grain orientations. Remember, I was talking about grain structure. If you look at different grain orientations, you see that different grains behave very differently. Some of them load and unload elastically. Some of them open a hysteresis. That hysteresis represents dissipation and therefore damage to the material. And that what uh, allows us to formulate fatigue strength description. Uh, we can also do micro beam lower diffraction looking at specific single grains the beam uh, which is a white beam many wavelengths comes and hits the sample here gets scattered into the camera and produces this kind of uh, beautiful diffraction patterns and we can interpret them again in terms of strain and then we can map remember i showed you grain a conceptual picture of grains right so this is not conceptual, this is real. This is the color corresponds to grain orientation. You see that the grain with red color is uh, different from the grain with green color. It also has these twins, which are straight bands running across the grains. And we can also see it under electron microscope. You see these straight lines, you see grain boundaries. So when people formulated these things back in the early 50s, they had little access. They perhaps could get images like this, but certainly not like this with different colors for different orientations, but they had a lot more time than we do to think. And so they came up with uh, wonderful, uh, insightful predictions. And now we can confirm them by looking at these colorful maps. And then we can see that even inside this grain, for example, here is one grain, uh, we can see contrast. That means that we have dislocation slip, we have um, internal stresses, and so this is proof of the uh, general picture that I've shown in the very beginning. Yes, indeed, uh, materials contain uh, different levels of organization and different stresses. Uh, now, how can we measure them? This is a method that I developed known as uh, FIBDIC, Focused Ion Beam uh, Digital Image Correlation. And the picture amongst these many approaches is here. The idea is this. If we want to measure residual stress, the stress that the material remembers, what we need to do is need to free it, but very locally. Locally means that we cut with a, a stream of ions very carefully around the central island. And we look at the deformation of that central island. If the island was compressed, when we open up the trench, it will expand. If it was expanded, when we cut around it, it will shrink. So we can quantify it and we can work out the uh, uh, deformation. Now, if you look at this uh, movie, it represents what happens when you cut around this island. Now, our eye is not good enough to see the deformation. But unlike Hook, we now have digital methods of analyzing the deformation. So if we take this region inside and we put it through uh, this kind of analysis, we take the surface image from the stack, we compare it with the original image, and we see the uh, displacement of these uh, relief of these uh, uh, contrast points of the speckle or of some sort of features on the surface from which we can extract strain. Now, here is a profile of strain that is extracted as a function of depth that we drill in the direction 0, 45, and 90 degrees. And you can see that they all fall onto a similar curve here is the formula for this curve that I have developed. And we see that we can independently measure the relief strain in the 0, 45, and 90 degrees. And that's wonderful because it's a bit like a strain gauge rosette. This is how engineers traditionally measure the strain in the material on the surface, except the strain rosette is many millimeters big. And this is uh, tiny, this is five microns. So this is much smaller than human hair. Uh, we also studied uh, the uh, process of relief by finite element modeling and came up with uh, further improvements. This was my first attempt at a formula 
these are much more precise and detailed uh, master function formulas. And furthermore, by using this approach, we can do depth profiling in the, um, from the surface. And these are some formulas based on eigenstrain modeling that allow us to do that. And uh, uh, here is a, a way to apply it to the most general uh, loading condition. So let me show you some results from this multi-scale analysis because I think it will help you understand what I was talking about. So we took a sample which is coated. So this is a coating. Or similarly, we took a sample which is polished in different ways. Now, people are always concerned, just imagine engineers, they want to build uh, a, an engine and they want to finish the surface of the material to the greatest precision to avoid crack initiation. And they don't know to what depth uh, they create residual stress because it's very difficult to measure. So they just guess, they imagine. But we now have a tool to check how different treatments uh, result, uh, lead to different residual stress state. So look, uh, this is zero. Uh, this is the surface. And as we go from the surface, if we polish the surface with three micron diamond particles, we get this blue profile. So the compression in this titanium alloy surface is about 250 to 300 um, uh, megapascals. And for three micron diamond, the, the profile extends beyond three micron, maybe to three and a half or something like this. If we then polish a bit more with a one micron diamond paste, much smaller, we get a profile which extends a little bit beyond one micron, so one and a half. So as a general rule, the depth to which you create residual stress is related to the size of the particles. If we use quarter micron diamond, we get uh, this kind of purple curve, which is be below one micron, maybe two thirds of a micron. And if we use colloidal silica, which is about 100 nanometers or even smaller, then it's really flat. Or if we do electro polishing, it's really, really tiny. So we have developed our method to the extent that we can actually guide people in terms of uh, surface preparation. Uh, Another very interesting topic is anisotropy, elastic anisotropy. These grains of different orientations, depending on which direction we load them, will have very different properties. And here is an illustration of uh, the Young's modulus uh, 3D uh, radar plot. So the further you are from the center, the greater the uh, modulus. And you can see that uh, uh, some materials like copper, nickel, and aluminum uh, have this kind of FCC structure, and um, some of them are more anisotropic than others. We can use this approach to assess residual stresses during FIB DIC milling as a function of orientation by using an isotropic elasticity. We should also take into account an isotropic plasticity. And here is another example. Uh, sometimes people say, what is the error of your measurement and what is the noise in your measurement? So to address this, we took a sample of titanium 6,4 uh, alloy. Uh, this is the map. Uh, the average grain diameter here is 6 microns, and the material was laser shock peened, uh, treated on one side. And uh, the profile due to shock peening looks roughly like this. And we were trying to match it with our measurements, and it turned out that it didn't match at all. And this was a great concern. We used five micron uh, uh, diameter, and it didn't match. And we thought about it for a long time, and then decided to increase the diameter to 10 microns, because that would make it bigger than the grain. And it turns out that if you make it bigger than the grain, then the profile gets matched much, much better. And what we can conclude from this is that indeed the stress results that you get are very stress is scale dependent. If you go small, you get this uh, very large variation, which some people would say is random, but we will see that it's not entirely random. It has certain statistics at least. 
Uh, and if you make your uh, probe, your scale of consideration bigger, then you get closer approximation to the microscopic. Uh, we took this even further towards analysis of uh, a piece of aluminum alloy a bent bar. And what I want you to see in different grains, you see these little circles. This is the FIBDIC markers, and these are the stress values that we've got for them. And if we show them on the plot of residual stress of type 1, the big circles with error bars are the FIBDIC measurements. And there is a whole series of FIBDIC measurements done here. And if we do the statistics, we see that it has a Gaussian distribution. OK, so in fact, when we say that engineering is based on just type 1, it's just this solid curve. But in reality, locally, it could be double that or it could be 0. right? So there is quite a huge. Uh, spread variation of the values, but at least we know the statistics. So the implications for design uh, are these. The traditional design is based only on type 1 residual stress. Uh, it could be too limited, conservative, or it could be too optimistic. We need to take it into account, and we need to quantify the residual stresses better. So here is my example, my uh, uh, picture of this residual stress in a polycrystal, which is kind of a, an extension to 3D and a more detailed discussion of what you've seen before. Uh, he, here is a model of a polycrystal, which consists of these grains. Here is a line across this model uh, in the section in the middle. And here is the stress profile. You see that this is the average this is type 2, which is average per grain, and this is type 3. Now, this looks smoother than we've shown before, and that's because our model is missing the detail at that level of uh, within the grain. But nevertheless, you can see variation even here within the grain. This is the average within the grain, and this is the variation across the grain. Okay, so then uh, I proposed to use uh, statistical analysis, namely the periodogram or power spectral density plot uh, with type 1, type 2, and type 3 ranges. Basically, on the horizontal axis is the uh, uh, length base on which we analyze. On the vertical axis is the um, um, uh, power spectral density. And you see that type 1 corresponds to long uh, length scales. Type 2 is the transition from type 1 to type 3, and type 3 is shown here. That's the intragranular that uh, you see here. And that's because we have imposed uh, a lot of variation here. OK, but what is the statistics? What uh, statistical distributions, what statistical laws does the um, uh, distribution satisfy? Uh, here is a paper which was published two years ago, uh, 2021, in my journal by uh, my student Jingwei Chen and uh, myself. Um, uh, look at it this way. We take a material, uh, which is a polycrystal. We apply elastic strain. This is the plot. Uh, and we sometimes apply, we also plot the plastic strain. And we want to study the statistics of elastic strain and plastic strain during deformation. Now, when the deformation is elastic, you see that the strain satisfies Gaussian distribution very well. When we go to 0.4% strain, the elastic strain is still Gaussian, although shifted to the left so somewhere here. But plastic strain, as you can see, has emerged, and it's asymmetric. If we go to 1.5, then 5 and 10% strain, you see that the elastic strain remains uh, limited because it cannot exceed 1% or even less in this case. Um, but the plastic strain is shown here. And it looks asymmetric, and it looks like it satisfies the log normal distribution or any other extreme uh, type distribution like Gumbel distribution. Uh, why is this? I asked this question and I spent some time scratching my head and thinking about it. And I came up with this idea. When we 
uh, consider elastic strain because it's very small, we think of it as additive. So we add a bit more strain added, a bit more strain added. When we consider plastic strain, which is larger, when you impose additional plastic deformation on what's already plastically deformed, you multiply uh, because you take logarithm of the um, ex uh, relative extension if you want to describe the, it correctly. And so I ran a little simulation where I took a uniform random distribution and as I kept adding it to itself within certain range, by ad additive process, I got the uh, normal distribution of Gaussian and by multiplicative, by multiplying, I got log normal distribution. Now, what is interesting is that it explains that the elastic strain that we see satisfies Gaussian normal distribution. The plastic strain that we see satisfies log normal or uh, extreme value distribution. Uh, what is the implication for structural integrity and design? What matters to engineers when they design something are the conditions for fracture. And fracture happens when your ductility, your ability to deform plastically is exhausted. You cannot deform anymore. So that lies somewhere here at the very end of the plastic strain distribution. And therefore, this statistical approach that I'm showing can be developed further into a framework whereby we keep track of the probability of certain volume of material carrying limiting strain or strain that exceeds the limit. And that's the condition for failure. So all this statistical analysis, even though it seems a bit abstract and uh, microscopical, in fact, it is uh, pointing straight at the novel design tools for structural engineering. So to conclude, the uh, use of multiple techniques across the scales from macroscopic to microscopic and down to nanometer dimensions is important to characterize the material. The internal stress stain is, uh, state is complex. It is multi-component, multi-scale and statistical, uh, as I've shown. And if we want to have a robust description of our system to uh, be able to design airplanes and uh, bridges and buildings and so on, we need to build up uh, 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 a database and a detailed description and uh, uh, use statistical representation for the fine scale and uh, then go to the larger scale description that we can use for engineering purposes. Thank you very much. That's where I'll end. Thanks for your patience and your interest. Thanks so much for this lovely lecture, uh, Professor. Uh, does anyone have any question in the audience? Austin, you don't want to ask any question. Maybe Dr. Joseph wants to ask a question. <laughs> Thank you, Austin, for your kind comments. Thank yeah, you. I have a question. Um, and though it's not my field of expertise, but it's really interesting to learn about new things. Uh, so I was wondering when you were doing this research, did you ever encounter any surprising results or uh, unexpected results during your uh, study? And um, well, can you say a little bit about them? Yes, Wajiha. Uh, I will quite uh, gladly try to answer your question. So you see, um, when I had the idea of this experimental technique uh, of drilling with an iron beam, my biggest concern was that the experimental error and the amount of noise that I will get during measurement will be so high that I will not be able to obtain the results with sufficient precision. And indeed, the very first time we tried it, it didn't look good. But then we were lucky enough to win a European project, uh, which brought together 
several laboratories from different countries. Some people were uh, doing experiments. Some people were uh, doing uh, coding uh, in MATLAB and in other uh, uh, systems. And we had to take quite a lot of time and effort to learn to deal with the noise. And now I'm not talking about the variation of stress. The variation of stress is not noise. It's physical. It's just how life is. But when you do the data collection in the microscope, there is noise that comes from electronic uh, interference, uh, imprecision of positioning, and so on. All that noise we had to filter. And eventually, we were able to write interpretation software, which was so good that it uh, measured really, really tiny effects, like I've shown on, in some of the examples. So perhaps the biggest surprise is this, that with careful data processing and algorithmic programming, it is possible to obtain high precision even out of quite noisy data. Uh, I mean, I'm sure it's not just me and other people discovered something similar in the research, but to me, it was a great surprise and a great relief that it works. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Thank you so, so much. So, I'd to answer a question. I mean, uh, I watched your presentation uh, for, for many years, and I see that your skill is uh, getting the more and more details of the materials. Yeah. And nowadays, for example, in electronics, when they are building the, the CPU or the, yeah, they are also uh, doing uh, smaller and smaller, getting more. And do you think that for the, for example, for the CPU, and they are now trying to do it a uh, three nanometer or two nanometer. Is there any, uh, because we after we understand the materials, then we are going to design and then make the users out of it. And do you think that there are limitations on on the on the, on the scale for the CPU or something? Yeah. Yes, I I I'm certain there are because, uh. You see, the current technology, as we know it, uh, uses materials such as silicon. And silicon has an atomic lattice where the distance between atoms is about 0.4 nanometers, right? So we're getting so close that soon we will end up with a single atom. But a single atom is very difficult to hold. You would need a lot of uh, equipment around that single atom, maybe for quantum computing. But certainly in the classical silicon uh, uh, chip engineering, we're getting closer and closer to the limit. When you get to one nanometer transistor, you effectively have two and a half atoms across it. That's too small. Yeah. You know, if you have two atoms, it's it's a little cube, two by two by two, which mm. is only eight atoms, and then you run out of, of space. So I don't think it will go much further than one nanometer. You know, one nanometer is the limit for this technology. And I know that uh, Moore's law uh, yeah. meant that we keep pushing and pushing and <laughs> always finding a way... Yeah to do even better, but there is a limit. And that limit is physical. It's mm -hmm. all okay when, like Feynman said, there is a lot of space down there, mm -hmm. but eventually when you run down to single atoms, uh, you have to think of another way. Yeah, this is especially interesting because, I mean, in these years, uh, conference, one of our major focus is on deep learning, artificial intelligence, and the reason why there are so much progress made in deep learning AI is that the computational power are increasing really, very quickly so that we have enough computation power to do the computation for the AI. Yeah. But yeah. if there are limitations, 
on the finally on the hardware yeah on the cpu scale new scale and then this may become a bottleneck <laughs> But, well, uh, I, I said I was very careful, Sunny, to say yeah. that mm. this current technology mm. will run into a limit. But there are other yeah. technologies. Yeah. For example, yeah. know, so, yeah. it's the they size to... of the crystal, a size of distance between atoms in a crystal. But if you mm. took electrons, they're much, much mm. smaller again. If you mm. took photons, you could pack them much closer. So mm. I think knowing how humans mm. think about it... Yeah. The next stage, people will be thinking much more about how to replace uh, silicon technology with something else. But again, knowing how people work based on the investment already made into mm. silicon technology, they will probably want to mm. adapt the mm. existing silicon technology, for mm. example, for photonics. Yeah. For photonic computer, computing rather than electronic computing. Yeah. That's uh, they need and new that direction. Will, yeah, and that will allow us to shrink again, and then maybe we can carry on with Moore's law, but yeah. with this change in, in technology. Yes, maybe we need some new kind of incentive or initiative, yeah. initiative so that to have new, like, for example, new, uh, more advanced or using different materials or quantum uh, computing yeah. But, yeah, and yeah. other direction besides the current uh, trend just to Get it smaller, 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 and then improving. Well, and then you see, improving. there's been a lot of discussion yeah. in the world about yeah. who has five nanometer technology and who has three nanometer technology, yeah. and yeah. who will have the next two nanometer technology. Yeah. Honestly, I think it's not that important. What is important yeah. is who has the next technology after yes. current silicon. Uh, I wouldn't worry too much about going from three to two because then you run into a limit anyway. It's much yeah. better to start investing now in a disruptive breakthrough technology. Okay. And an interesting question. And which country do you think are leading in this direction? United States or UK or Germany? Um, China. Uh, <laughs> No, no, no. Seriously, I, 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 my, my opinion about this is is the following. First of all, as editor in chief of the journal, I can see the not just the volume but the quality of publications from China, which has increased tremendously. And yes, I uh, agree. I, 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 I'm not sure, but I, I suspect that the number of scientists working on these problems in China is probably equal or greater than the number of scientists in the UK, US, uh, and Europe combined. Okay? Uh, and uh, therefore, I think uh, uh, the quantity combined with quality mm. and combined with rational investment which is also very important because, you know, in the past, you could have enthusiasts like the guy who invented the steam engine, right? He invented it because he was interested in, I don't know, printing or some plant and so on. It wasn't mm -hmm. uh, an order from the government and it wasn't mm -hmm. done by grant or mm -hmm. investment. It was just his own initiative. But these days... Uh, the, the the challenges that we talk about cannot be overcome by just uh, a single university lab working on it or something like this. You need a network, you need all sorts of uh, combined tools, and then you have a chance. And I think uh, uh, China has the capacity to do that and the will to do that. I don't know about... Uh, Europe and US. I know in the UK, for example, there have been quite a few initiatives uh, aimed at quantum computing development. But typically in the UK, what happens quite often, they may be very good at uh, uh, researching the fundamentals, mm. but not so good at manufacturing these days. You know, there was a time when Britain led the world in the industrial revolution and, and production. But these days, what typically happens is 
it goes somewhere else that 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 new scientific breakthroughs are implemented in technology and it happened to give you an example um lithium ion batteries were discovered by uh john goodenough mm. the guy who got the nobel prize a couple of years back and unfortunately mm. recently died but mm. uh, fortunately at the age of 98 mm. so he lived a long life and mm. he's done a lot of good but he mm. Uh, invented a lithium-ion battery in Oxford in the early 80s. Mm. But the commercialization only happens in the late 80s in Japan. Okay, not in UK. He, uh, even though he was yeah. working in Oxford and he did because all the they... work and so on. Yeah. yeah. For the uh, commer it, commercialization, it takes exactly. a lot of you know, work. It, it takes a lot of investment. It, I, I can't remember whether it was Sony or some large Japanese company Mm. Uh, and then, of course, that meant that they were able to reduce it to practice and to develop production of lithium-ion batteries. And there was a period when all the lithium-ion batteries in the world were Japanese, mm. right? Mm. Yeah. Uh, and of course, then uh, it 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 became uh, omnipresent. And now each of our mobile phones has this lithium-ion battery. And now all the hype and talk is about uh, solid state battery or sodium ion instead of lithium ion and so on what i'm trying to say is it is not just a matter of discovering the science and even discovering the technology it's also a matter of commercializing the technology and that typically requires large investment and uh, so uh, my bet is on china <laughs> From my own experience, yes, the paper we received about AI, more and more pay, AI paper are from China, and the quality are also increasing a lot. Yeah, yeah, in yeah, recent yeah, yeah. years. No, yeah. I think if you if you if you look at uh, the number of uh, Chinese papers, and I don't just mean Chinese mm -hmm. named authors, but authors mm -hmm. who are working in China, yes, uh, in nature uh, has increased dramatically which mm. means that it's not just the quantity, it's also the quality that is very high. And I think it's fair enough. Uh, Hardworking people produce uh, interesting results. Uh, that's good for the world. I see Austin was asking about stresses in human as well as in metals. Uh, Austin, uh, stress is a very uh, widely used and abused term. And it means different things. Uh, the way doctors use the word stress means uh, mental, uh, emotional, psychological. Uh, the way engineers use stress is internal force inside the material. And of course, it can exist in metals, in polymers, in ceramics, and also in biological tissues. Let me just make this little uh, sideways path. So in biological tissues, stresses are very important because they determine, for example, healing of uh, tissue after some sort of trauma or damage. They determine uh, bone reconstruction and remodeling. So if you have a broken bone and you bring the two sides of the bone together, it starts to grow scar tissue and to connect it. And nature is very clever like that. And Stress is important because if it is not loaded, it will not grow so quickly. So there was a Russian uh, a surgeon by the name of Ilizarov who developed the famous machine where uh, you put the two sides of bone in a special frame and every day you pull them apart by fractions of a millimeter. And he managed that way to extend bones sometimes by 10 centimeters. A huge amount by using stress inside the living tissue to keep it working hard to produce new bone. And so for people with deformities, for people who have one leg shorter than the other, that was a great way uh, without having to put implants and to put something to grow their natural bone to, to improve the situation. Yes, an interesting question about Thank you, colleagues. Uh, it's a great Thank pleasure you. to be with you. Uh, mm. As ever, uh, Sunny, thanks for the invitation. Mm. I, uh, as I said, mm. I am uh, uh, always been a, 
uh, and am still a great supporter of the conferences. And uh, moreover, I think I'm long overdue uh, visit to Hong Kong. So I hope one of these days I'll be able to come again. Okay. Thank you very much, colleagues. Of the video thank before you, thank we are happy to yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Okay, bye bye. Thank you. Likewise, bye bye.